So it's a fairly nice long bar, you know, and uh, uh, when you when you look the cross section of this uh, place, it covers almost every nook and corner. So the whole idea of creating such a long bar was because I mentioned earlier about being a bartender's bar. And when I say that and making bar as the hero, because when you have a nice long bar like this, every customer sitting wherever mm -hmm. across this floor mm -hmm. has a direct connect with the bar. So you know exactly what's going on. So it gives you that feel of sitting at a bar, not at a restaurant, right? So that's the first thing. Now, technically we've divided this into three stations. We have mm -hmm. three cocktail stations. So three professional bartenders can work. So each of this is a cocktail station. So we have all of the mixers that mm -hmm. is there in front, the ice bin, the sink, mm -hmm. and then all of the mixers that is required uh, on each of the stations. So there's a garbage bin, there's there's ice, you know, chest. Mm -hmm. So these are three cocktail stations. And then we have the back bar. Now the back bar, is divided into three sections. So on this side is where we have a lot of the you know darker spirits, but lesser known darker spirits. So you would see a lot of bourbon whiskeys. You would see some you know you know single malts. You would see a few wines, and you would also see a few liqueurs, right? In the center, we have mostly scotches, right? Ideally, even on this one, we had scotches, but now that we're three years old and got quite a few awards that you'd like to show off. We've put them here, but otherwise you will see mostly single malts and blended scotch whiskies over here because that is what the Indians love. And that is what is very popular with most of our guests. So therefore we have them stocked amongst the two shelves. And on this side of the bar is where you see mostly the lighter spirits. So here we have the vodkas and the gins and the lighter rums, some tequila, mezcal, if there is any. So all of that happens on this side. This mm -hmm. is the lighter spirit counter. And the reason why it is divided into three forms is because as a bartender, when I'm working over here and somebody orders like, let's say, a single malt whiskey, mm -hmm. he knows exactly where it is placed. So the back bar has to be set in this fashion all the time. Mm -hmm. And wondering. if there's any kind of a change that takes place, mm -hmm. it is purely with the consent of all the bartenders because oh, okay. otherwise, you know, I might just change something over here. The other bartender might be looking for it. He'll get completely Got lost. It. So the back bar and the front bar is always set in this manner. Then of course the glasses of various types that mm -hmm. we keep right over here above the chiller. Oh, and it's uh, matching to the sort of drinks they would ask? No, more than that, this is uh, this is like, you know, you're working in the front, it's okay. easy to just pull a glass. So whenever there is a drinks order, the first thing you do is take a glass and place it there, right? Okay. So it's easy to pull a glass from behind. Uh, also, it gives more space for your, for your mm -hmm. setup in the mm -hmm. front. There are some bars where, you know, you don't have the back bar space like this. Mm -hmm. So you do not know where to stock your glassware. Mm -hmm. So you suddenly have glasses stacked in the center of the bar. Mm -hmm. You know, so with each station, there are glass stacked next to it. Mm -hmm. That's because you do not have space at the back or you do not have a glass hanger. Okay. So that's when all of your glasses come with the working station. Over here, what we try to do is we try to keep our workstation free mm -hmm. in terms of space so that you can have more stuff there, whether it's liqueurs, whether it's mixers, all of that equipments. And then the glass takes the back seat. You know, mm -hmm. it's right behind you, mm -hmm. on top of the chiller. So this is a very classic style setup of a bar. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, again, the size of the bar will also matter in terms of the number of covers that I have. Correct. The size I was, of the I was space. about to ask you. So there's three stations are there. What mm -hmm. is the maximum people you can serve in your so capacity? So with this station, on a good day, you can easily serve hundred cocktail drinking audience. I'm talking about a per station. No, the three stations three station. together. I'm talking about a cocktail drinking audience, which means every time you make a cocktail, you're consuming more time, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it's not a beer bar, it's a cocktail bar. So, you know, people order drinks, so it takes a little time. We also do a lot of customized cocktails, so it takes a little bit more time. Got it. And the bar is based on that fact that, okay, if I have 100 covers here, I should be able to cater to all of them 100. If all 100 decide to drink cocktails, Correct. I should be able to cater to them. Right. Had it been beer or straight drinks like whiskeys or vodka mm -hmm. tonic, then it would be much easier. You could cater to that with just two stations, mm -hmm. half the size of this bar. Mm -hmm. uh, but because it's a cocktail and bar... And all three of your bartenders sh should know how to make cocktails? Exactly. So, like I said, these are three cocktail stations. So each cocktail station can produce all of the cocktails from the menu. Got it. As well as... The That's the way you set up. Like it's exactly. exactly three things. Absolutely. It's just a repli uh, replica of... And what about the, the flow? Let's say this customer... Uh, what about the money? Uh, he has to go and bring a bill himself or he... Someone else is running around. Bar runs no, so, you have? So the, at the bar counter, you have about 12 to 13, 14 stools. Okay. Amongst all the bar counter guests, you manage amongst the three bartenders, you manage. So sometimes because this particular bartender is also taking care uh -huh. of the this floor side, yeah, order, yeah. 
and that bartender on that side is taking care of the floor order from that side mm -hmm. the guy who's in the middle mm -hmm. is actually only taking care of the guest in the bar counter correct so he's relatively you know less stressed in terms of what he's catering to so therefore he will make sure that he's taking care of all the checks how, how do you know just from the visuals uh, that some uh, hey guys things are not going right right like what, what do they do that means let's go back to our things and you know you uh, you know because I come with a lot of experience with the bar even when I'm standing on the other side correct distance I look at the bartender the moment I feel he's uncomfortable is when I feel the bar is not right yeah <laughs> Got so, it. so then I walk in and I always some things out. Or I always look at the ice. I always look at the mixers. I always look at the glassware yeah, and see yeah. where does it need my support. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, sometimes there are too many orders coming. He might not be able to, you know, dispense all of the orders at time. So I go and look at the order tickets and I mm -hmm. say, okay, which are the things that you want me to dispense? So I mm -hmm. pick up the order ticket from there, come to the center and help him out. Mm -hmm. So the help that I extend to the bartender is not just going and fixing a drink. Mm -hmm. It could be helping him with more glassware, mm -hmm. helping him with providing the right ice or the mixers mm -hmm. or maybe cutting the garnishes for him or just selecting the right glass or just mm -hmm. shaking all of the drinks that he's mm -hmm. put the mixers on. So the first thing that I notice is the body language. The moment the bartender mm -hmm. is uncomfortable, you know there is something wrong. Mm. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> important. Great point. Uh, let's go on a on little bit of science behind this, right? So mm -hmm. obviously I assume that whiskey is your number one category with Celsius. So that's why you put it there, mm -hmm. I guess. That's what, right? And maybe uh, gin is something which you want people to sh so that will be your slowest category am i correct i guess yeah if it's that's, placed there. that's the slowest uh yes. and what changes let's say a tactical questions if i if i literally said you know uh all right you know let's let's grow 20 percent sales this month mm -hmm. what changes would you do here in this setup which will result in actual uh, efficiency what we will then do is we will try to you know, more than that change because it's a cocktail bar, mm -hmm. you know, it's not a straight drink bar. So this will may not change so much, but the front may change a lot. Okay. So in terms of the prep, so what we might then do is, uh, I mentioned this earlier on as well, you know, it's, it's a cocktail bar, it takes time. So every time you spend or ev you know, every time there's an order for a cocktail, the more time that you spend in making the drink, you're losing on your time to sell a drink. Mm. But if you can quickly dispense the drink, you make more money. Mm. Right, because bar business is I finally now know why cocktails are expensive. It's yeah. the time. No, it's the time and so therefore your preparation have to be correct. Got it. So there are bars which kind of collapse in between when it gets busy. Yeah. And you might have a big bar, but you might just collapse uh, and your service might slow down. Yeah. The moment your bar service slows down, yeah. you're losing on revenue. Got it. So what we try to do is when we know that, okay, our focus is going to be quick sales, especially on Fridays and Saturdays, our prep is so good that Understood. it's a two-step process. Okay. So what we do is every time there's an order of a cocktail, it's a two-step process. So a cocktail that would otherwise take three minutes will okay. only take 30 seconds, hmm. right? So which means I'm being able to take out six cocktails in, in, in uh, three minutes, mm -hmm. which would otherwise be the time for one cocktail dispensing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I'm saving on time Got because it. the bar business is purely about Number quick of service. Yeah, yeah. And it's only a handful of hours. Correct. And the difference of bar operations are very simple. At a restaurant, if you have 100 covers, you only have 100 guests. Because everybody likes to be seated when they're eating. Got it. But at a bar, if you're a 100 cover bar, you might have 125 guests. Yeah. Because people are okay just floating around at the bar. Yeah. And sometimes means, you may lose actual customers because there's just line. Exactly. You know, because yeah. the moment somebody has to wait for a drink too long, yeah, I uh, finally convinced Sally to come and have a wine and then I lost Sally because of the line. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. So, right. so therefore, we try to emphasize on the fact that your prep is great Got it. and all of your drinks are a two-step process. Um, on here, right, uh, you said about the, the mood and the, you know, uh, what kind of, like, walk me over some experiences uh, which you remember, which, you know, uh, are, are funny or a memory, you know, which you think, or maybe a good hustle, you know, like just give us some case studies here where you think, wow, that bartender did an amazing job. Or that that customer just ordered that 1800 cocktail just because he or she fell in love with the bartender like any examples that come in mind like it was a pure bartender execution so I think this was this happened just before the first COVID lockdown I think this was towards the end of 2019 early 2020 I don't remember the exact time but this is definitely a Saturday night and two gentlemen walked in around I think about 12 o'clock and then in the night and the night by by one we shut the bar but they were in a great mood because the band was performing and the band was probably doing the last set so the intensity of the song was you know it's like great energy at the bar at mm -hmm. that point mm -hmm. in time so he walks up 
and he orders a gin and tonic and I'm looking at the the guest two of them order a gin and tonic and he says I would like to have a premium gin so he looks at more of the most expensive gin mm -hmm. and he gets a gin and tonic and then you know the atmosphere is great and then what I liked about the bartender is you're very interactive mm -hmm. says can I twist a gin and tonic and twists his gin and tonic he uses you know I think he took up grapefruit or something and mm -hmm. did a gin and tonic made, made it look really nice and beautiful and then I think he started chatting. The, the guest started to talk to him. And then by the time he finished the gin and tonic, he said, why don't you do a short, round of shots? You look mm -hmm. in a great mood. And then he went on to do the shots. Interestingly, instead of just doing the shots amongst the two, he said, can I buy shots for everybody at the bar? Wow. He said, yeah, sure. So he purchased shots for everybody at the bar. And his billing within a span of half an hour was 45,000 rupees oh. INR Delhi. for two guests. <laughs> To guess now that is quick yeah, yeah. and it's quick money within a span of half an hour for two guests wow great apc yeah, yeah yeah and that is purely because of great presence of mind of the bartender i think that if the bartender could just serve him a gin and tonic not even and the key him. here is you're at the end almost still he Absolutely. did that no at like 12. what i think that the bartender realized is that you know like i said it was a Saturday night, the yeah. band was performing the last set, yeah. the energy is really, really high, the guys walked in, he's picked up the most premium gin and he's ready to do shots. And then just little things and would you care for a shot? And he was, you know, it came from him. He said, like, can I buy shots for everybody else? Nice. I said, do, sure, you can. Do you uh, uh, like incentivize your bartenders to drive sales or is there any, anything or it's purely non-pressure sales environment? So it isn't, it isn't, uh, a very sales driven bar what we focus on mostly is uh you know i'll tell you uh, as a hotelier Got we it. used to have the session where we were trained uh, by the learning and development we used to always go and attend a session which was purely about selling and upselling skills correct and i was always against upselling skills i would always say there is nothing called upselling skills uh -huh. in the food and beverage business uh -huh. i would always say suggestive selling is a better way yeah, of putting yeah, yeah. it forward so I'm not saying rip him off because if the customer feels that, okay, I have had a great time today or, you know, yeah. he pays your bill and the next morning when he wakes up and looks at the bill and says, true, you know, that bar was really expensive. I've had that feeling. Off, yeah. And that's sad. <laughs> but, that, oh my God, it was an expensive. So, so the focus that we lend and, yes. and the focus that we always tell our employees to figure out is, you know, when the guest wakes up the next morning and looks at the bill, he should say, wow. Yeah. He should not even care the figures. He should just say, wow, great night experience. Had. You're right. Right? And that is more important. So, yeah. so when you asked me that question earlier on in terms of the pricing and how you increase the pricing and yeah. I didn't really was very comfortable answering that question is because to me, I always felt that I would not want to price my drink at a premium. I would rather want an experience to be given to the guest. Got it. So instead of one, you have two. Hmm. The amount of money that I made hmm. would still be more than what I would have done with just one drink. True. Like you, might, you can come to my bar. Hmm. And you can buy a drink that's averagely priced, mm. but the drink and the experience is so good that you say, let me get another one. Mm. Right? So in totality, the amount of spend is mm. higher than my beverage costs Got to it. the profit ratio. What so are the three uh, biggest challenges you as a bar owner uh, find on your weekly things and how do you, how do you tackle that? So one of the biggest challenges is running a bar in India itself is a challenge. Okay. So, so Give me an yeah. example of uh, India and London. What are the differences, for example? No, there are a lot of other issues, you know, because, because uh, for example, in Delhi, okay. there's been a revise in the excise policy. So oh. we were paying almost about 11 lakhs for a, for a year. Meaning a lot of compliance, exactly. paperwork. Exactly. Licensing is a big thing. Got it. Right. Uh, every year you got to renew your licenses, which means you go through the same process. Is it every year? Every year. And then you go through wow. this almost the same process. My, uh, you know, so so what happens also at times is you know, for example, the new policy, you're paying double the fees this year onwards yeah, yeah. as compared to last year. So instead of a ten percent or a twenty percent hike, it's just double. So if mm. you're paying fifty rupees last year, you're paying hundred bucks. Now that takes up your cost, and certainly you cannot double the price of a cocktail or a drink, mm. right? Uh, and you got to also make sure that you retain your stuff. So all of those things are big challenges, mm. which I think the, the system does not really understand. Uh, and that is where I think it becomes a little difficult for all of us uh, mm. in, in the business. It tests you, right? Your patience. <laughs> One last question and then we'll wrap. Sure. You know, what, what's, a, uh, what's something that you would want to tell young bartenders? You know, uh, in a, someone who's trying to grow and who's really passionate to grow their career. Mm -hmm. You know, anything that you would want to say in the camera just for the young bartenders out there? So this is something that I keep saying to all 
amateur bartenders or young bartenders or the bartenders of the future, I always say, very important, you have to think big. So you need to dream big, think big, and work towards your goal, your vision. When you do that, the one thing that you need to keep in mind is there's nothing called shortcuts. So never ever try to take shortcuts in life because it really makes a weak foundation. So if you have a weak foundation, you will always struggle in the later part of your career. So the idea is to make a strong foundation, have a big dream or a big ambition, but no shortcuts.